is wonderful. into our midst this morning. And Father, as we approach your presence, we approach reverently and humbly. And we pray that you give us revelation knowledge of your word. Thank you, Father, for in Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. Can we have our seats, please? Praise God. Okay, this morning, the topic before me is the gifts of the Spirit. Now, when I got this topic, I, I was in a fix because I'm a teacher of the Word. I actually teach the Word, you know. And, you know, it will, it will take months, actually, to cover the gifts of the Spirit. If we're, if we're to look at the gifts one by one, you know, there are, there are nine gifts, yeah? Do we agree to that? 1 Corinthians 12, there are nine gifts of the Spirit. And they are in three categories. The power gifts, the revelation gifts, and the utterance, right? Now, if I'm to pick them one by one, I don't think we can finish in a month. I mean, give me two hours every Sunday, I still would not finish it in a month. But... I was quizzing myself. I was asking in my spirit, how do I go about it? And, well, God gave me a good idea. So I'll just speak on the not-so-common ones. Then from there, I would also talk about the Holy Spirit. Now, we, we all know the text, right? 1 Corinthians 12. Um, Paul was trying to teach about the spiritual gifts. It says, now I write to you concerning the spirituals. I know in your King James Version, you have the gift written in italics there, but <clears throat> in the actual Greek translation, it's not there. So Paul was basically saying, now concerning the spirituals, brethren, I would not have you ignorant, concerning the spirituals. And we all agree that we're spiritual beings, yeah? You are a spirit, isn't it? Now that your body is just a container, right? You're a spirit that has a mind, a will, an emotion. And that emotion, that will, everything is encased in a body, right? So when you die, this goes to the ground. It decays. But that is not the end of you. you that's not oblivion for you, right? There's continuity to life, isn't it? Because um, God is a spirit. And God bringing forth after himself will birth what? A spirit. So, when we die, you don't also lose your mind, isn't it? Your memories remain, right? Your will. That is why Lazarus, when Lazarus and the case of the, uh, case, uh, case of the Lazarus and um, the rich man, uh, we know what happened, right? They still have their memories, isn't it? So, now, I will discuss with us in the short time that I have um, 
maybe like four or five of the gifts, the one that are, that for me. Now, we know the greatest among all the gifts is uh, the word of wisdom. Now, if, if, you, if you really want to get to know all these things better, right, I'd recommend a book. Now, the person that God gave the revelation of the gifts to, the teachings, is um, the name, by the name of Howard Carter. Howard Carter, right? Howard Carter. You can get the book. Um, I, I, I'm trying to see if I can remember the title of the book. Uh, just hold on. Let me check here. I think spiritual gifts and their operation. So get the book and read it. You would have detailed knowledge of all the spiritual gifts. But what I'm concerned about here today is how those gifts can impact our lives. And that is the most important thing for me. So the first thing I want to talk about is the Holy Spirit before we go into the gift. Now the day you give your life to Christ, you were adopted, right? You were adopted and instantly you were given the ability to call God Father. Now I know a lot of us don't know the value of that because of the way we live. We don't. You know, John said, behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed. There's a weight to it. The word behold doesn't mean you just run through it. Behold means take, take a stand, take a gaze. There's something valuable for you to read afterwards. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed. There was something that was confined on you. And that's why the Bible, when Paul was talking, Paul said... Now are we the sons of God. I think it was still John, right? It was John. Now are we the sons of God. Now are we. He did not say we will be. He says now are we. And Peter said what? We are partakers of his divine nature. It means you're not, you're not less than Jesus. Now I know there's a divine class that Jesus belongs. Right? Being the son of God. But you know, Jesus Christ says something, I think, in John 20, 17, or John 17, 20, 20 or whichever one. It says, okay, let's open it. Because if I say, if I, if, I, if I mention what he said, some of us will probably want to argue with it. John 20, 17. And we'll read John 17, 20 also. Now, this was when Jesus appeared, right? After he was dead, he resurrected. He hadn't ascended unto the Father, right? And Mary was about to touch him, and Jesus said what? He said, don't touch me yet. He said, I have not yet what? Ascended unto who? My Father and your Father. My God and your God. Then let's open to John 17, 20. Or 23, rather. 23. John 17, 23. John 17, 23. He says... I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Now, do you know that God does not love Jesus more than he loves you? Do you agree to that? Do you agree to that? The same authority he has in heaven, he gives to you. Now, Sorry, is it possible that if I call Pastor Jimmy now to stand up and come here, will his head just stand up and start coming towards me and leave his body? Is it possible? If that happens, what will you do? I believe everybody will run. If his head leaves his body and starts coming towards me, you would all run. You know why? The name the head is called is also, part, is also the name the body is called. So Jesus being the head of the church, it means you are also Jesus. And that was why when Paul was talking about, he said, when Paul said, do not be yoked with an unbeliever, what did he also say? He says, ye are Christ, isn't it? You need to understand that what has Christ got to do with what? So when God looks at you, he looks at you as what? As a son. The same with Christ. That was why when Jesus was to go, he said something to the disciples. He said, he said I, I will not need to go to the Father on your behalf anymore. 
He said, you go to him directly, isn't it? And ask him whatever you will. So you need to understand the class to which you belong. And don't let the devil hit you here and there because you don't know who you are. And now, so you have the Holy Spirit residing in you. If only you know what that means. If only you know. If only you have a little idea of what that means. That was why when Paul said, if the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwell in you, what would he do? He will quicken your mortal body. I tell Christians, when I tell them you're not even supposed to fall sick at all, they look at, they look at me and like, how possible is that? I mean, as a Christian, you're not supposed to fall sick at all. You're not supposed to welcome sickness into your body at all. You know why? Because the same blood that flows in Christ flows in you. He's the vine, you are the branch. Right? The same sap that flows in the vine flows in the branch. So you need to understand the value of who you are. Now the spirit recite. Now I understand that when Jesus was here, he had the spirit without measure. Now you don't have the spirit with, with what? Without measure, right? I understand that. But because of the access we have to the Father, just because of that access, you have unlimited power with God. That was why Jesus said what? If only you will believe. All things. He did not say some things. He said all things are possible to him that what? Believeth. All things. All things, not some things. You know, it's a, in, in a particular place, he said, he said what? He said all things are possible to God. He said nothing shall be possible with God. But if you compare the two statements, are they, are they different? Because he said, if you also will believe, nothing shall be impossible for you. Right? So, the first thing you need to know is, because a lot of people are so concerned about the gift. But they forget the giver of the gift. You know, the giver of the gift is the Holy Spirit, right? You know, what he does is he walks the gifts through you. It's not that he actually gives you the gift. So when you hear Christians say, I have the gift of this, it's not that they can at will use it. No, you can't. You can't just wake up one day and say, I want to operate with the gift of word of wisdom. No. It is as the spirit wills. But you know one thing that he does? The closer you get to him, the gifts are tools, Right? The closer you get to him, he makes available the tools as at when needed. As at when needed. So let me pick on the gifts now because of time. If not, I would not even start on any one of them. Now, I said, so I'll start with the greatest of the gifts, which is what? The word of wisdom. Why is it the greatest? Because there's nothing greater than the wisdom of God. You know the wisdom of God, of God is Jesus Christ. Right? If you read the book of Proverbs, you'll see that Jesus is the wisdom of God. So, you getting an advantage to be able to tap into the wisdom of God. There's nothing that supersedes it. That is God giving you an idea of what he wants to do. Of his plan. His purpose. There's nothing greater than it. So, it is the greatest of all, all the night gifts. It is God giving us a directive or a directive word. For example, you go and meet a lawyer, right? No, I'm not preaching this morning. I started with a little, a bit of preaching, but I'm basically a teacher, so I'll, I'll just break these things down to you. You go and meet a lawyer, right? Now, the lawyer does not connect with a wire, your brain and his brain, right? What does he do? After you tell him what your ordeal is, isn't it? What would he do? He'll give you a directive. This is how to go about it, isn't it? So that is what a word of wisdom is. Giving you what a directive. For example, God told Noah in Genesis chapter 6 verses 13 and 14. God said, Noah, the end of, the of flesh, of all flesh is come before me. Make an ark. That was a word of wisdom. God intended to destroy, right? He wanted to wipe out the whole thing because everything was what? Totally corrupt. So what did he do? He came to Noah and said, Noah, I'm giving you wisdom here. 
I'm about to do this. You have to do this. Else, what is wisdom for? Wisdom is what? To save you from what? Something, isn't it? It's, it's somebody telling you something, giving you a directive to do something that what? Will yield benefit to you. And then another example is Jonah, right? God told Jonah to what? To go down to Nineveh, isn't it? We all know the story. God wanted to destroy uh, these people because of what? Their iniquity. But God what? Because God wanted to also save them. Now, you need to know that God is not just all about, because some people have that ideology that God is this wicked God. He's ready to squatch you once you make a little mistake. No. He's a God of love. So God wanted to extend his love to the people of Nineveh. So what did he do? He sent what? He sent Jonah to them. That was God giving him what? A word of wisdom. To go and what? To go and preach to them so that they will be saved. Now, word of knowledge. For example, let me talk about my own personal life. There was a time um, my sister was pregnant, right? I think that was with our second child. No, it was the third child. They never planned for it, but, you know, it, it, it just came. And at some point, because I wasn't for, I think I was, I was very busy then, and she was towards the time, it was towards delivery. So she went to the hospital. And suddenly, I, I, that day I slept, and I had a dream. I had a revelation. And what happened? In the dream... My sister died in trying to give birth, right? She died. And I woke up and I started praying because I knew God wanted me to pray about it, right? That was a word of wisdom. I started praying about it. After praying, I slept. And the dream continued for exactly where it stopped. And I went to my sister and I prayed on her and she came back alive. Now, back in the real world, what happened? I didn't know my sister was already, you know, in delivery and my mom was with her. My mom is MFM, you know, and they don't like spreading news. They'll tell you once any news that goes out, the devil would pick it. So she didn't even inform we, the, the you know, the, the brothers. So I did not know. And suddenly it was after it happened that she called, you know, and giving us the testimony. My sister actually died, right, on the, on the, on the delivery bed and... She started praying, and she coughed and came back alive. Now, if I hadn't taken a step to what? To pray, what would have happened? It was God giving me a directive. It was God telling me what to do because something was about to happen, right? So, God gave me insight to that. Now, let's move ahead to another one. The word of knowledge. It is the communication by the Holy Spirit of the knowledge of the, of the Lord. Now, there's a, there's a thin line between word of wisdom and word of knowledge. Now, word of knowledge is a communication of the knowledge of the Lord. Now, let me give us examples. For example, Elisha and Gehazi, right? What happened? Someone was cured. The man of God said, this is for God. All glory to God, I'm not receiving anything, right? But what happened? Gehazi felt that he wanted to take part of the, you know, the money that would come from that um, event. So he ran after um, the man who was healed. And what happened? When he came back, Elisha looked at him and said, where, where did you go to? I said, no, I, you know, what did Elisha say? He said, was my spirit not with you? It was like Elisha was there, isn't it? Now, that was what? God communicating knowledge to him. Making him aware of something. Now you're here. And someone is seeing what you're doing. In your room. Right? You just committed a sin. And as you walked into the church, the pastor says, come. God showed me what you just did. And you start shaking. Right? Now, those things happen. Don't you believe it happens? That's why I said, the more you move closer to the Holy Spirit, He gives you insight. He gives you insight. He gives you insight. A lot of us are 
are bothered about life. We're bothered about what to even do next. And we need insight. But you're far from the Holy Spirit. The one who gives the gift, the one who works the gift, you're far from him. You don't spend time with him. You see, a lot of Christians, they want more of God, but they are not willing to give the time. I've always said it. The more time you spend with God, they are, you, you partake of his attributes. It's a default thing. You spend time with a woman. You, you see couples that are 30 years in marriage and you see they start looking at like, isn't it? You know why? Because they spend time with each other. When you spend time with God, you partake of his what? Of his unshakableness. You, you be calm. When things happen, you know, we'll talk about one of the gifts, right? The gift of faith, which I love so much. I love that gift so much. And it happened once in my life. Okay, not once, maybe like twice. It's, it's, it's a rare gift because it's a very powerful gift. So you say you want more of God. You want that peace. When something little happens, you're jumping here and there. The Bible says, he that believeth does not make haste. He doesn't. Even if they say the deadline is 30 seconds from now, you just be joyful. There's an unspeakable joy that will what? Be flowing within you. The Bible says what? With what? With joy we draw from the wells of mercy. Of what? Of salvation. That's that joy. That joy. You're unshakable. He will keep him in perfect peace. Who's what? Whose mind is stayed on him. You're jumping here and there. Oh, you're looking for who to marry and you're jumping here and there. You're worried. How will I pick the right guy? How will I pick the right lady? You know why? Because you are far from the one who can give you the word of knowledge. Who can tell you? He can just, just like that. Hallelujah. Look at the woman, the Samaritan woman who came to Jesus, right? Who had, who had gotten five husbands before, right? How did Jesus see the whole thing? Word of knowledge. Your eyes will suddenly be opened and you'll see into what? Into the realm of revelation. And you begin to see things. And when you're telling people, they'll just like, like how? Hallelujah. Another example. Isaiah 45, 5. God told Isaiah, Is there a God beside me? Yeah, there is no God beside me. You know what happened in that little time? God, the, wish, the, the knowledge of God must have spanned or sc and scanned through the whole universe for God to be able to see, or through Isaiah, to be able to say what? There is no God beside me. Because if there was one God that was beside him, it would have been revealed, isn't it? But there was a quick search through all... You, you know how vast the galaxies and the universe is? Billions of stars. And in a quick split of second, God revealed to, to, what, to Isaiah, he said, See, there is no God beside me. There is no one else anywhere who is as powerful as I am. I'm the Almighty. And that is why you need that gift, right? So that you have divine insight to things. Divine what? Insight to things. Now, let's move to another one. I'm just trying to, because of time, you see, I have 15 minutes more. So, I'm just trying to touch on them. Now, the sending of spirits. This is a spiritual... Or supernatural revelation of the unseen world. The what? The supernatural revelation of what? The unseen world. The ability for you to see the unseeable. And you can tell also, when you see spirit, you can tell if the spirit is of God and if it's of what? Of the devil, no matter the camouflage. No matter what? The camouflage. You would be able to what? To say this, you know the devil can appear as an angel of light. The Bible says so, right? And some people have been deceived by that. Somebody comes to you. You know, one day I was very angry. I was, <laughs> I was in Antony there. Before I had a car, I, was, I just alighted from the bus and I, I crossed to the other side. I wanted to take the next bus to go to the house. And one guy was driving and he just st suddenly stopped and said he's a prophet. 
and his eyes saying nonsense. And I looked at him and said, do you even know who you're talking to? You're talking to a child, a son. Who knows who he is? I just laughed. I didn't even hear the nonsense he was saying. Some of you, somebody just accosts you on the road and starts saying nonsense that this and this will happen. I just laugh. You know, you should learn to laugh at the devil. If God has not told me, it's not going to happen. But somebody comes and tells you this, and you're already, you're already up and down. You know why? Because you have not gotten closer to the one who is the Almighty. Before the end of today, I pray that that strong relationship will be enacted in your life in the name of Jesus. Now, it is a power to what? To look into the other world, to see the unseeable. Plus, it carries with it the power to judge. For it is not sufficient to see, but also to be able to judge what is seen. Else, you will not be able to distinguish between the evil spirit, isn't it? And the spirit of God, right? So, it gives you the ability. You'll be able to say, okay, this is God. I have, I have operated in that gift a couple of times. Most times when I meet people and they tell me they are children of God or pastors or whatever, you know, by default, I just know suddenly, even without hearing them, I just know suddenly that this person claims to be a child of God, but nah, there's something somewhere that is not clicking. And 99% out of 100, I did not get it wrong. As a man of God, I, you know, there was a particular day I went to my friend's place and I picked up a book. I wouldn't mention the name anyways of the author. Immediately I picked up the book. Just within me, and like an inward intuition, I just knew that no, there's no connection. This, this is just false. And I told him, I said, drop this book, don't read it. He looked at me, he didn't, he probably was not, he was also a very good friend. He's a good friend, rather, close to God, but probably he didn't have the gift or something. But he did not know. So I told him, I said, drop the book. He, he laughed at me. And you know, years after. We were talking about it and I told him, I said, can you see what I told you? So, the closer you move to God, this gift have the ability to what? To be worked in you by the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Now, let me talk about the last one that I have here. The gift of faith. There are so many of them. There are nine of them, rather. I said so many of them. Nine of them. But I think I've talked about the gifts of word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, the sending of spirit. Now, the, the ones I left out there, I, I believe you have a little understanding, or if not, a better understanding of them. That's why I left them out. These ones are quite dicey, right? Now, the gift of faith. Some, some would say, what, what is different between the gift of faith and having faith? Now, the gift of faith is faith imparted by the Spirit of God for protection in terms of danger, in times of danger, or divine provision, or it may include the ability to impart blessings. Now, just having faith is you believing, right, what the Word of God says. I, I always teach, faith begins where? Faith begins where the will of God is known. If you don't have the will of God, if you don't know what the will of God is, you can't have faith. For example, if I walk into this room, maybe, let's take it that I'm a billionaire and I just walk into this room and I said, I have a billion dollars. Does that give you the right to come and ask me for any money at all? It doesn't, isn't it? I only told you who I am, right? But if I walked into this room and I said, I have a billion dollars and I'm ready to give a thousand people a hundred thousand dollars. Now, there will still be some, or let's say, okay, because of the crowd here, let me say, I want to give just 10 people a hundred thousand dollars each. Now, there will still be some confusion somewhere, right? Because you would not know if you partake to that or if you're a partaker, isn't it, of it, or probably you belong to that, the category of 10 people I want to give to, right? You would still be doubting if I go and approach him. Am I part of them? But if I walked into this room and I said, 
I have a billion dollars and I want to give each and every one of you here a hundred thousand dollars each. Now, immediately you know you, you what? You qualify. And you can come to me on that legal ground, isn't it? And tell me, you said you were going to give a hundred thousand dollars and what? I've come for mine, isn't it? So, I tell Christians, when you need something from God, when you want something, but there's no basis in the word, then there's confusion. Because you don't know if God wants to give you that thing or not. And there's always the other, there's also the other side of the divide. Some people don't even know how to approach God because they don't study. Right? These things are well written in the Bible. For example, I see a lot of Christians. In fact, I believe every one of us here, we know that scripture that says what? By his stripes we're healed. Isn't it? Right? But how many people would have the slightest of headache here and the first thing you would do would be what? Most of you would not even consider God in the equation. How much more when it is malaria or typhoid or it's what bigger than that? Some of you would not even consider God as the first option. But when you know that the word of God says by his stripes you wear, if you wear, it means you are, isn't it? It means you would, you would, when the symptoms start showing up, what do you do? You look at your body and say, I dictate how my body feels. Not my body dictating how I feel. I dictate what is going to dwell in my body. Not how, I own my body. So you tell the devil, pack your load and what? And get out. Because how many of you will be here? I don't know how possible. Um, you get into your house and you see a rat playing. And you decide to start playing with the rat. How many of you do that? What do you do? You chase the rat out. Why? Because it's your domain. So why encourage it? Oh, but some of you will say, okay, but I've read it and I quote it when the problem comes now, but it doesn't happen. You know why? Because the word hasn't gotten into your spirit yet. You still have just a mental accent, accent of it, isn't it? It is not just knowing it by head, isn't it? Healing starts from the spirit because you are a spirit being. It starts from the spirit and what? And comes out in the body. I've shared the story before, not here. I remember when I was serving and I had the, all the symptoms of malaria all over my body. And I said, devil, listen, no. this is not a bargain. I said, you have brought all these symptoms, right? It is not my own. I said, I am going to, you know, when you, know when they, when you are sick, they say you should eat. Eat more, isn't it? For, I said, one, I'm, you know I don't take drugs. I, I'm not going to buy drugs. And I'm even going to fast again on this so-called thing you say you are putting in my body. And you know what? I went on a fast, not eating. For the first two, three days, I had all the symptoms fully manifested in my body. I was so weak. But I said, what? I said, devil, I'm not moved by what I feel. And on the third day, the whole thing vanished. I can't remember the last time I felt sick now. You know why? Because you have to, I got to a place where I was convinced. You meditate. It's not just reading the word. It goes beyond that. The Bible says what? When God was telling Joshua, what did he say? He said what? He said, this book of the Lord shall not depart. You shall meditate what? During day and night. As you meditate, you know what you're doing? Your spirit is receiving it and is building a block. A building block. A pillar in your spirit. So when it gets there, you're so convinced even more than what you see physically that no matter what the devil does, it won't work. So the gift of faith was what Daniel exhibited. You think it's easy. They tell you that if you pray, you'll be thrown into the lion's den. And immediately, go and read it, Daniel chapter 3. Immediately they signed into law. Immed Listen, I did not say the next day. Immediately, when the news got to Daniel, the Bible said what? Daniel entered his room. You know, how can you, you it was so daring, isn't it? Immediately he heard, probably somebody came to him and said, ah, they just signed it to, no prayer. What did he do? He entered his room. He said, no prayer, have he? He entered his room. The Bible says his blinds were open. He left them open. Let them see. And he went on his knees. And the Bible says, Isaiah is giving thanks to God. And when they took him, took him where? To the den of the lions. What did he do? Did you see Daniel shouting? And say, ah, God, I'm in trouble now. No. Daniel went in. 
and it was peaceful. And God sent an angel to what? To hold the mouth of the lions. Another very good example is Peter. They just told Peter that he was going to be what? They were going to behead him, isn't it? Sorry, how many of you would be told that the next day, you just have a night, just like six hours, the next day, you're on a display, they are going to put your head before the bulletin and they are going to slice it off. And you'll be able to have a sound sleep. Even as a man of faith, ha, ha, you will pray that night too. But you know what happened to Peter? The Bible said Peter slept soundly. Oh my goodness. You need to get there. To the extent that when the angel came to wake Peter up, he did not just speak. The angel had to what? The Bible said the angel smote him. It means he was having the best sleep of his life. You know why? Jesus had told him, see, you will get to your old age and there, something would happen. So there was a prophecy. There was something he had in mind. So what was exhibited there was what? The gift of faith. The last time I came here, because of time now, it's three minutes of time. Let me just share this. I, I shared the testimony the last time I came here, but for the purpose of those who were not here, my miracle phone testimony. This was like seven years ago. I was in church one day. Quite an expensive phone. Like seven years ago, like 206,000 naira. Yeah, 206,000 naira. I was in church singing with the choir. I sing. So, what happened? My phone was just on the seat where, but I, I think I took the phone, I brought it closer anyways. And by the time service was done, where is the phone? The phone had developed legs and had gone. Whoa, in the house of God. I thought it was probably a prank, isn't it? I started asking. And they said, no, 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 nothing. Your phone is gone. It dawned on me when everybody started leaving the church. And we were now few, right? And now, this is not a joke. Oh. This phone has gone. Oh. You know what? People were coming to me. The choir members were coming to me and they were like, oh, sorry. Oh, but you were also careless. Now, how would you put a phone there? And you know what? From within me, something rose up. Till today, sometimes I look back and I was like, what happened? Something rose up and I said, I looked at them where they were seated, all the choir members. I said, I said please, don't come to me and tell me that. I said, I'm in my father's house. I said, I, my, I said, my phone is not stolen. I said, the person who took this phone will walk back to me with his own legs and give me back this phone. And I said, listen carefully. I said, I will not go home and pray about this phone. I said, why? Because this is my father's house. I said, when I get home, this is what I'm going to do. I said, I'm going to dance before my father and I'm going to sleep. After I said, some people looked at me and were like, what are you saying? I also looked at myself, what did I just see? But you know what? I got home that night and I sang beautiful songs and I slept. Was it easy to sleep? It was not so easy. But you know what? Within two, three minutes, I slept off because there was a peace that was running within me. And I woke up the next day, right? I had no car then. I used to, I go all the way to Lekki to work for work. I'll first take a keke mara from my house to the bus stop. Normally, I had like a covenant that I made. I said, God, if I, anytime I enter KK, if I see any secondary school student, I'll pay for them. So, this morning, a secondary school child got in and you know the first thing the devil said to me? It was like the devil was speaking to me live and direct. He said, are you still going to continue with your covenant? Your father was in the house when your phone was stolen. He was ad addressing God, right? He said, your your God was there when your phone was stolen. And he said, you are still going to continue your covenant with him. I said, devil, listen to me. I said, with the same vigor, with the same strength, I will continue. And I smiled. And you know what? As I, as I did that, a tear dropped from my eye. And I smiled. I got into the bus. I always preach in the bus in the mornings. As I was about to start again, the devil said, ah, who are you going to? You are, so you are going to talk about the same God in this bus. Are you going to tell them about, about your phone that was stolen? I said, I said, devil, watch me. And I got up. I enjoyed preaching that morning. People gave their lives to Christ in the bus. I got to work. 
Now, for complete five months, my time is up now. For complete five months, people were asking me. You know, people would try to ridicule me in church because they used to call me the man of faith. They call me Kenneth Hagin because I love Kenneth Hagin so much. They would come to me and say, Hagin, I about your phone now. My choir master would come and laugh. He said, Sephas, your phone, your phone is gone. I, I would always smile and say, sir, watch out. One day, I was to preach in church, and I got up and I, said, I told them, I said, see, I said, I'm disappointed that I didn't have an idea of where the phone was. But see how I was talking. I said, in church that day, I said, I'm so disappointed. Nobody can even join me together in faith and say this phone is coming back. I know what? I can never forget that day. This day, I went to work. I closed from work. I didn't even want to go to church that day because of traffic. But something said, some, the Holy Spirit said, he said, go to church. He said, go to church. I said, I said, okay, I'll go. And I left, got to church. As I walked in, it was like something was telling me, the person who sold the phone is in church today and is going to get you back that phone. To cut the long story short, you know what happened? At the end of service, this guy walked up to me and gave me back my phone. How was I able to hold out? It was a gift of faith. Beyond all doubt, something clicked in me. And I said, as far as God is concerned, the word of God never fails. Let's just open our feet. I don't know who you are here this morning. But there's one thing that is sure. The word of God is ever sure. The word of God is what? If only you can spend time with it. Time. And get that word into your spirit. Oh my goodness. You're unlimited. Just one prayer point. Father. Say Father. Help me to love upon you. Don't, don't pray for the gift yet. Just say Father. Help me to love upon you. Help me to love upon you. And that was why I sang that song in the begin, at the beginning, right? I know your name. I know your name. Your name is wonderful. I know your name. When you know him, it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship. The gifts will flow. Say, Father, help me that I will know you. Oh, that my ways will be committed to you. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. I don't know if there's anyone here. All eyes closed. I don't know if there's anyone here. You want to say this morning that I don't know you, Jesus, but I want to know you. Ha. Ha. I can, I can share testimonies upon testimonies. I've been in a bus before. And as I entered the bus, it was, it was word of knowledge or word of wisdom rather. I knew there was going to be an accident. Immediately I entered. And I started praying. Because God wanted me to pray. And by the time we got almost to the destination, the, the bus lost what? Its brakes. But I was peaceful. I was calm. I was just, I was, in fact, I was even sleeping. You know what? Nobody got what injured in the, in the bus. The bus lost its brake at full speed. On full speed. When you are close to God, you are sure that the devil cannot tamper with you anytime he wants. Because there's a relationship. You hear people say, they say they have faith and they died. No. When you have the ability to talk with your father, you don't just die. If there's someone here today, you want to give your life to Jesus, can you, can you, all eyes closed please, can you wave your hand? You want to give your life to Jesus, can you wave your hand? Okay, no one. If you're here, you want to rededicate your life. Just, I don't need to, you to come out, just say, Father, I am sorry. I reconnect with you this morning. In the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name, we all have prayed. Father, we thank you this morning for your revelation knowledge of your word. Father, we thank you for the spirit that comes with the word. 
We thank you because we know we have it in us already. The seed has been planted. And there's always nothing wrong with the seed. It's just our hearts. Father, we pray that today you will clear up our hearts and make them clean. And that as these words have resided there, the devil will not be able to tamper with them. But Lord, they will bear fruit in hundredfold. Thank you, Father, for in Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. Amen.